uh, okay everyone uh, welcome back again <laughs> so we're gonna <coughs> continue with the five uh, khandas the five aggregates or five factors of personality or however you want to translate it uh, and uh, this is kind of the deep deeper side of the path so far we have been already looking at lot of, lots of profound things uh, but this is where the path really kind of culminates in these kind of insights so that's why it is uh, particularly interesting on the one hand uh, challenging on the other uh, and uh, just uh, kind of uh, but still i think very interesting that's the most important point uh, so uh, uh, what i want to look at now is how to actually contemplate these things in a practical way yeah this is not something that you have to wait till the very end of the path to become an arahant or anything like that it's a gradual process to contemplate these khandas, these uh, five aspects of personality. Uh, and I want to discuss that a little bit. But before we do that, uh, let's just finish off the uh, previous sutta. The, this is the uh, Anatalakana sutta and just kind of get, take it all the way to its conclusion. So uh, we were saying that all aspects of the five khandas are ending up with the all kinds of consciousness, yeah, uh, whatever it is, uh, is not mine, I am not this, this is not myself. And then the Buddha continues and he says, seeing this, a learned noble disciple grows disillusioned with form, yeah, or grows, uh, rejects form, if you like, or um, uh, uh, what other nice words are, has um, almost like aversion towards form, or um, is repelled by form, something like that. Uh, yeah. All of these are ac acceptable translations, probably. Uh, he's disillusioned with feeling. Uh, the noble disciple is disillusioned with perception, uh, with choices, uh, and with consciousness. Being disillusioned or being repelled by these things, uh, desi desire uh, is given up or it fades away. Uh, when desire is given up, they are freed. Uh, when they are freed, they know they are freed. Uh, they understand birth is ended, the spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. There is no return to any state of existence. So this is what happens when you see these things, because what you see, you see that all of these things are, basically they are problematic, yeah, they are a burden, they are suffering. And because there are, is no self involved in this, you have no interest in any anymore. The reason we are interested in the mind and the body and the five khandas uh, is just because we see a self there. We see something that is of interest to us. Uh, but just like the leaves in the forest are not of any interest to you, uh, in the same way, when you see the non-self nature of these things, uh, you cease to have any, it doesn't matter anymore what happens to these things. Uh, it's got nothing to do with you. And because they've got nothing to do with you, uh, you're able to see them as they actually are, as problematic. As long as we have an idea, this is mine, this belongs to me, uh, it's impossible to see that suffering fully because you have a, an interest in these things uh, by the very fact that you think they are a self. Uh. So then you, once you see them as suffering, oh, you know, it's not just that you are dis, well, disillusioned, maybe but it's like you, are, you just reject them. Uh. Yeah, you want to get rid of them, basically. That's what it means, uh, because uh, you don't want to hold on to suffering. Uh, if you touch that hot plate we were talking about before, uh, you don't need to think, I have to withdraw my hand from the hot plate. It's automatic. The mind recoils. Uh, it has a degree of aversion and a rejection of that hot plate. Uh, you pull your hand back automatically. In the same way, the mind withdraws from that world. And when it withdraws from that world, eventually, if you do that often enough, you destroy any kind of desire for these things. How can you desire suffering? There's no way you're going to desire suffering. You're going to reject the whole thing. For that reason, craving comes to an end. And this is then the liberation on the path. This is what liberation means. Liberated from these five khandas, these five aspects of personality. And because you are liberated from that, because you don't crave these things anymore, because craving is gone, you don't project those khandas into the future. Yeah? Because craving is always a projection, the idea that I want to exist in the future. But when you have no craving anymore, there's no 
wanting to go anywhere, to exist in the future, that idea of projecting yourself uh, into some future existence is gone. Uh. That's what craving does, it projects you in this way. Uh. So you are liberated, uh, and you know that you are liberated. This is a kind of the important point. Uh, yeah? If you have any doubts, you think, yeah, you know, could I be an arahant? Maybe yes, or maybe no, who knows? Uh, maybe I'm an arahant, I wonder, I'm an arahant. Well, if you think, wonder if you're an arahant, you're not an arahant. Uh, you know when you're arahant. Birth has come to an end. You know that there is no more rebirth. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, you don't actually have to even see your past lives. Uh, you know that uh, rebirth has ended uh, by the fact of ending craving. It's like this uh, inferential knowledge we talked about before. Uh. So the spiritual journey has been completed. Yeah, there is nowhere further to go. This is the end of the spiritual journey. You don't begin the bodhisattva path at this point. You finally become an arahant. You think, yeah, maybe I should hang out a bit longer to help all beings. No, you, you come to the end. Yeah? What had to be done has been done. There is no return to any state of existence. That is what the Buddha said. Satisfied, the group of five mendicants were happy with what the Buddha had said. And while this discourse was being spoken, the minds of the group of the five mendicants were freed from the defilements by not grasping. So that's the power of that kind of discourse. If you are ready, if you have practiced the path all the way to the end, if you have the power that samadhi imbues the mind with, yeah? then when you hear this kind of discourse or you reflect in this way, then the outcome is the ending of the defilements, the ending of rebirth. It's kind of astonishing, isn't it? You read that and you think, yeah, it kind of makes sense maybe, maybe not, not sure. But some people become arahants by hearing that. It's kind of extraordinary. And it shows you, of course, the different ripeness of the faculties, spiritual faculties. It's, of course, quite rare to find people with faculties that are so powerful that they can see things in this way. So now, how can we use these teachings? And uh, you know, one of the things that the Buddha says in a number of places in the suttas, uh, he talks about contemplating the five aggregates. He talks about knowing form, knowing the arising of form, knowing the ending of form. Knowing feeling, the arising and ending of feeling. Knowing perception, knowing the arising and ending of perception. The same thing with choices or the will. The same thing with consciousness. So what does it mean when we read this? What does it mean to know these things, see its arising, see its passing away? What exactly are we seeing here? And there's a few ways, a few different ways that this can be seen. First of all, the idea of knowing the thing means that we have to understand something from you know, in its broader sense, what it means in all kind of contexts. You need to know the full extent of something here. Yeah? You have form, you need to understand the coarse form, the refined form, uh, the form you have in meditation, the form that you take with you all the way to the edge of the immaterial attainments. Uh, yeah? You need to have an understanding of that. Uh, uh, and because then when you understand the full scope of these things, uh, well, then you can kind of make a decision about it. Is it good or is it bad? What is it? Uh, you need to see it's arising and passing away. How does it come into existence? And when you understand that conditionality, then you know that these things cannot have an inherent existence of their own. Yeah? These things are conditioned phenomena. They come into existence because of causes, and they disappear because of causes. And again, the meaning of that is that these things don't exist on their own. They are inherently unstable. And seeing that undermines the interest in these things, because if they are unstable, well then, you know, like we've seen before, then they are problematic. You can't rely on them. They are inherently unreliable, uncertain. They're never going to give you that thing which you're hoping to get, which is stability, a sense of self, and all of these kind of things. So how do we actually contemplate this? And uh, the way to contemplate this, and this is, again, you find this really in the Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing, and it's surprisingly straightforward. Yeah, there's nothing really kind of magical about this at all. And in that Sutta, I should have included it here, but uh, somehow I didn't. Uh, but in that Sutta, you have the 16 stages of Anapanasati, yeah, of Mindfulness of Breathing. Yeah. 
And the first 12 stages are about uh, observing the, uh, the long breath, uh, observing the short breath, uh, observing the whole breath, uh, calming down the breath. Uh, yeah, this is like gradually things becoming more and more clear to you, more and more mindful, things calming down. Uh, and then you breathe in, uh, experiencing rapture. Yeah, now it becomes, not, not, in, not only does it calm down, but the joy starts to arise. Uh, you breathe in and out, experiencing pleasure. This is the sukkha, even more profound pleasure. Uh, you breathe in and out, experiencing the, uh, uh, the um, citta sankara, translated by Adan Sujato as emotions. Yeah, these emotions, which I think is a good translation. Uh, in other words, the same emotions that you had before, those perceptions that go along with that. Uh, then you calm down these emotions, these perceptions. Uh, then you experience the mind, that's a step number nine. Uh, and then you gladden the mind, step number 10. Step number 11 is you unify the mind, you bring it together, you attain a state of samadhi, yeah? samadhaang chittang. And then the last one is vimochayang chittang, liberating the mind, step number 12. So this first 12 steps of anapanasati is this gradual calming down, experiencing more and more joy in your meditation, yeah? Like we mentioned before, the two things that define whether your meditation is going right or not, a in gradual increase in stillness and peace, and a gradual improvement in the happiness, the gladness, and the joy, becoming more and more subtle, more and more powerful as you go deeper. Yeah? So these are the first 12 steps, and then come the last four steps, and the last four steps is really where the insight starts to happen. Yeah? And these last four steps are anicca nupassi. Anicca is impermanence, right? Unreliability. Anupassi is to contemplate. You contemplate impermanence. Step number 13. Step number 14, viraga nupassi. Viraga here means like fading away. Contemplating fading away. Niroda nupassi. Step number 15. Niroda means ending or cessation. You contemplate the ending of things. And then final step, step number 16, is patinisagga nupassi, which means contemplating relinquishment or giving up. And this is all about insight, understanding things. What is it that we understand when we look at impermanence? Well, the process, what, what we understand is the process we have been going through, yeah? Because the process we have been going through gives you the raw material because you have just been seeing these 12 steps. You've been seeing the transformation in your mind, becoming more and more peaceful, experiencing more and more joy and happiness. You have things disappearing on the way as you do that. So you have been experiencing that process. So when you come to the end of your meditation, you come out of this, uh, you look back on that process uh, and you start to understand what is going on. Uh. And this is how it is usually described in the suttas. You don't gain the insight during the process, but afterwards. Uh, yeah? And this is a very interesting thing because it's, again, quite different from how often this idea of vipassana and insight is explained. I'm not saying it is impossible to get insight during the process, but usually in the suttas it's afterwards, when you come out, when you emerge, you look back and then you contemplate what is going on there. Yeah, so what is that process, those 12 steps, calming down, feeling more and more bliss? What is that process? And what it is, is the five khandhas, it's the five personality factors, yeah? Those five khandhas are what is changing, what is uh, morphing from one state to another one, uh, gradually disappearing, gradually fading away, etc., etc. That is what that process is. Uh, that is the five khandhas. So this is how you contemplate the five khandhas. You look back on your meditation, you understand that meditation according to these uh, anicca, viraga, niroda, etc. Uh, that's where insight comes from. Uh. So actually, it's quite straightforward. It's kind of the thing that uh, you know, we have been trying to do here almost every day at the end of the meditation. Ask yourself, uh, what happened? How do you feel now compared to what you started out? Has anything disappeared? How did the, I've been focusing on how the process work to encourage the peace and encourage the joy and these kind of things. But you can also ask yourself, what has disappeared in this process? What is different now compared to where I started out? 
So this is what you do. You come to the end and then you have anicca, nupasana, yeah? contemplating impermanence, contemplating unreliability. And you look back on the process and you see the breath. Yeah? The breath is impermanent. It is changing. It is gradually becoming less, becoming more joyful. Yeah? This is like the rupa, the form aggregate, yeah? changing, because the breath is an aspect of form. Yeah? The breath is a is you know, something that you feel in a physical way. Yeah. There's, of course, feelings also associated with that, but the basic idea of the breath is that it is rupa aggregate. So you're seeing the changing of the rupa aggregate. This is anicca, nupassana, with the breath. And then the breath is fading away, right? The breath is becoming more and more refined as you go through this. This is the viraga nupassi, seeing the fading away of things. And then when you start to come all the way down, maybe to the, you know, the mind becomes very prominent, step number nine or 11 in the sequence of calming things, where you start to see maybe nimittas, yeah, the bright lights in the mind, suddenly the breath is completely gone. Niroda nupasana, seeing the cessation of things. Yeah, you see how things are ceasing as you go through. Same thing with the body. The body is an aspect also of rupa, yeah, the feeling the body, the heaviness of the body, the seeing the body, all of these kind of things. And it's exactly the same thing. The body initially might feel kind of a bit unpleasant, a bit of pains or whatever. And as you go through this, the body starts to fade into the background. The breath becomes more prominent. The, um, when the joy comes up, it's almost as if you cannot, almost not feel the body anymore. The body becomes kind of irrelevant, starts to become irrelevant. First of all, changing. Then the body is fading away. And eventually, when you go fully to the mind, the body is completely gone. Niroda, nupasana, the body is gone. What happened to the body? And, yeah, and so the body is gone. So completely impermanent, completely given up. You see these things. And of course, what you see here, when you see that, you don't just see impermanence. You also understand something about happiness and suffering here. Because when the body is gone, it's delightful, yeah. You're so happy that the body is gone. You realize how heavy and how, how much pain and trouble there is with this body. It's very hard to really understand that fully before the body is completely gone. But when the body is gone, wow, this is so beautiful. That is when you get an insight into the problem of the physical body. And uh, what is even more interesting is that uh, when the body is gone completely, let's say you go into a deep state of samadhi, and one of the things that characterizes the deep state of samadhi is that there is no access to these things anymore. You cannot even access the body. You cannot even access the five senses. And because there is no access, it must be non-self. Because a self, by definition, is something you can access. Yeah? If you can't access it, then of course, it is beyond your realm, so to speak then you understand also it is non-self. So here, what you are seeing here is you are seeing the three characteristics, yeah? Impermanence, something ceasing completely, uh, suffering uh, and non-self, uh, merely by contemplating that process uh, that you have been going through. Uh. Interesting, right? Uh, isn't it kind of interesting? Uh, and it's kind of straightforward. It's almost like you don't have to think about this. It is almost natural because it's kind of obvious. It very helps a lot that the Buddha points these things out because then you, you, know, you feel more confident maybe. But it is going to be very obvious when these things happen because it's staring you in the face, really. And you see the degrees of impermanence. Yeah, one of the interesting things here the Buddha talks about anicca, viraga, niroda. Anicca just means that things are changeable. Viraga means that change has a certain direction, a direction of becoming less and less and less, yeah? fading away. There's a direction to the change. And then finally, niroda is the ending of things, and that is kind of the, uh, the highest kind of impermanence, when something ceases completely. And that is where you understand impermanence properly, because the full cessation of something really is what impermanence means in this uh, yeah, obviously, a yeah. full ending of things, full impermanence, that's what it means. So this is how you see form 
body. Yeah? Five senses are an aspect of form as well. You see the same thing with the five senses. Uh, gradually, they become less and less. They're fading away during your meditation practice. Uh, and eventually, they cease completely uh, when you enter a deep state of samadhi. Uh, yeah? And then they're completely gone. And then you realize, actually, much better off without these five senses. Uh, who needs to see? Who needs to hear? Who needs to uh, you know, taste anything when you can experience so much bliss? Uh, far better to hang out with this kind of bliss uh, rather than having these senses uh, irritating you all the time. Uh. So you see the impermanence of the senses, uh, the fading away, the cessation, uh, and then you realize the suffering because it's better, much better off when you don't have them, uh, and also the non-self because you can't access them. Uh. The senses become irrelevant. Only thing that's left is the mind. Yeah. So this is uh, how it goes. You can also see that there are some problems here. Yeah. And one of the problems here is that um, the senses are very close to us, uh, and this idea of voluntarily going blind, uh, yeah, or voluntarily going deaf, it's not easy. Yeah. Especially when we are not used to kind of these alternative states. Uh, but the thing here is that when you enter a deep state of samadhi, it is like voluntarily going blind. For that period, you cannot access your sight, and you don't really know whether it's going to be forever or not. Yeah, you're just entering the state, and things have kind of changed completely. You're voluntarily going deaf. So, of course, that is difficult. That's why it is hard, because we are attached to these things. And that's one of the reasons why it seems kind of Scary, yeah, because you're giving up something which is so integral to your ordinary experience. This is one of the reasons why we try to contemplate the downsides of the sensory world beforehand to make this transition easier. So you can see both sides of the coin here, how it works and why, also why it is difficult. And then you have the feelings. That is kind of looking at the, from the first kanda, the rupa kanda, the... Um, form or the body, bodily experience that we have. Then you have the feelings. Yeah? When you start out, you still have maybe painful feelings. The body is still prominent and the, you know, you, you can't, it's a bit difficult to settle down straight away. You have to move your body a little bit. And then as you settle down and the things become more peaceful, the pain starts to disappear, it starts to fade away, yeah? it becomes less prominent, it becomes less important. You start to enjoy the peace, then you enjoy the positive feelings, and eventually painful feelings come to a complete end, they're completely gone. Impermanent, changing all the time, fading away through viraga, gradually disappearing, and then eventually niroda, when you go into a state of samadhi. You can see this process happening, yeah? And then you know that, uh, well, you know, su surprise, surprise, painful feelings were painful. <laughs> you get that insight into painful feelings. They were dukkha. That's not so surprising, perhaps. But, uh, you know, you see it fully when you go into a state of samadhi. You didn't really know how problematic they were until you came to the samadhi. You understand that they are impermanent. They're not an essential part of you. Uh, you understand their non-self nature because, again, you can't access them. Uh, then you have the happy feelings. Yeah? The happy feelings are also changing, yeah? becoming more and more refined, uh, giving up certain happy feelings, uh, finding more peaceful happy feelings. Uh, yeah? There's a change in the happiness levels. Uh, you can see the impermanence in some of those feelings. Uh, they're fading away and eventually they cessation. The deeper you take the samadhi, if you go all the way to the fourth jhana, all happy feelings come to an end completely gone. Yeah? The fourth jhana is characterized by the uh, adukka masukka vedana, the neither pain nor pleasure feeling, the neutral feeling if you like, that's all that's left. So it's completely gone. Happy feelings are completely impermanent. They are completely gone and you are better off without the pleasant feelings. This is kind of one of those weird things about the Buddhist path. You come to the fourth jhana, all the pleasant feelings are gone. And it's better. Neutral feeling is better than pleasant feeling here. You have just been through the highest happiness as you can possibly, that exists in the entire human realm. And then you go beyond those highest happinesses and it's even better. Neutral feeling is better than happy feeling here. And of course, at that point, you, uh, you, you, um, 
you, you understand this whole samsaric existence in a very deep way because all of samsaric existence really has always been about chasing after happy feelings and avoiding the unpleasant feelings. And suddenly you realize actually you were chasing after something that is better, not, not, not even interesting to you anymore because you found something better, which is neutral feeling. But this undermines so much of uh, samsaric existence. And this is one of the reasons why the fourth jhana is one of the most powerful states in, uh, you know, to become fully enlightened or become, I reach full awakening, become an arahant or whatever. Uh, because suddenly all the things that normally motivated you to do anything in the world, uh, all that is taken away. Uh, there's no motivation anymore to go after happy feelings uh, and certainly not painful feelings. Uh, so this is kind of weird territory. One of the things about feeling uh, is that uh, feeling is a very powerful area to gain insight into our existence. Uh, because feeling is the thing that drives our existence. Yeah? Feeling is the thing that motivates us in almost everything we do. You get up in the morning. Why? Well, basically, it's like to, because you're motivated to create a a life for yourself, right? If you work hard, you will gain certain results, you will gain more happy feelings. If you have a nice breakfast, you know, you have a certain happy feelings or whatever. Everything in our life is driven by these feelings. Feelings are one of those very, for that reason, it's maybe in some ways you can see it as the most fundamental of the five khandhas, because without feeling, nothing has any meaning in life. Everything is meaningless without feeling. Everything we like and dislike is because the feeling that it gives us. So by contemplating feelings and seeing even happy feeling as actually being not really all that interesting at the end of the day, of course, that gives you a very powerful insight into the giving up of the whole idea of existence. Existence doesn't really have any meaning anymore after that point. So it becomes easy to give it all up. So you, this is what happens with these kind of insights. It's one of the fairly common ways of uh, gaining insight in the suttas, uh, how people became arahants, uh, awakened beings at that time of the Buddha, is by contemplating precisely feeling, uh, because that is what gives life meaning in this way. Yeah. So the feelings are changing, yeah? contemplating feelings. Uh. Then there is perception. Uh. Same thing with perception again. Uh. As you go through this process, yeah, of calming things down or making things more joyful, going through the perception, sorry, the process of watching the breath. Uh, perceptions are changing all the time. Uh, they're becoming much more simple. Uh, you're giving up the perceptions that come through the senses, uh, gradually fading away. Uh, yeah? uh, after a while, all you have left is the perception of the breath. Uh, and that You may perceive that as happy or unhappy or whatever. Uh, and then as you go through the uh, the breath is given up and you have the perception of the mind. The perception of the mind is things like the nimittas, you have the bright lights in the mind. These are perceptions again. Uh, so perceptions are always changing, becoming more and more refined. Uh, a large part, most part of the world is completely given up again. Uh, the almost entire field of perception, which is so diverse, is given up. And all you have left when you enter a jhana is perception of uh, uh, happiness and joy. I don't know if you can remember, we were just reading through the uh, Potapada Sutta before, uh, and it says that all that is left when you develop these perceptions yeah, is a perception of joy and happiness born of seclusion. Yeah? The um, Viveka Japiti Sukha, that's the, all the perception that is left at that point. Uh, so there's almost nothing left, tiny bit of existence left, all these various perceptions that we have, all gone. Uh, it's all impermanent. Uh, it has all ceased, all come to an end. You cannot access it anymore once you enter the jhana states. You can throw it all out. It was all dukkha. You didn't realize it. Now you can see it because now you have achieved something, an alternative, something beyond that. Yeah, every time you go into your meditation, you can actually see these things happening. Maybe not all the way, but maybe a little bit. That is enough to give you a little bit of understanding what is going on then there is the will, the sankhara, kanda, chaitana, yeah? And uh, 
initially, when you start out, your mind is thinking a lot. Yeah, the will is still very active. That's what, how you know the will is active, because your mind is thinking and kind of running around doing all kinds of things. But hopefully there will be times when you feel quite peaceful. Yeah? And that sense of peaceful is actually the will gradually dying down, uh, the will becoming less active. Uh. And then uh, when the mind comes to the point where the bliss starts to arise, uh, it comes easy to focus on the bliss, uh, then the mind becomes very, very peaceful. There's very little willing left, maybe tiny movements of the mind, yeah? a little bit of shift in your perception, a little bit of shift in how you feel about things, uh, but very, very still at this point. Uh, the will is becoming very, very subtle. Uh, and of course, what you see here is you see how delightful that is. Uh, what a pain in the backside. <laughs> Actually, it's not a pain, it's a pain, it's, it's a, pain, it's a general pain. Uh, the will is, uh, it's really problematic. Uh, yeah, it is actually so much nicer to get rid of this will. And you realize that identifying with the will is identifying with dukkha. Yeah, you're identifying with dukkha all the time. If you are the doer, you are the creator, you are the, you know, the this creative person who creates all this wonderful thing in the world. Actually, what you're doing is you are stimulating this dukkha inside of yourself every time you do something creative. So it kind of it turns this idea of uh, the creativeness in the world, which we kind of put so high on the pedestal, turns it around. Uh, and we understand that actually, in the final analysis from a kind of profound Buddhist point of view, uh, actually it is problematic rather than being a positive aspect of existence. And then you go further, and eventually you come to the point where you have to give up all the will when you enter a jhana state which is 100% unified uh, and there is no movement anymore, uh, samadhi ja piti sukha, piti sukha, happiness and joy that is born of samadhi. Samadhi means the complete unification of the mind. Unification means no movement of the mind anymore. Uh, then the will is completely gone. Uh, there's no movement. Uh, you cannot access any movement. You cannot do anything at all. The will is completely gone and you're achieving the highest bliss you have ever experienced. Uh, you understand the will is problematic. This is, this is where things get really profound because uh, the will is one of the things, again, we identify so much with. So seeing that this large aspect of your existence actually is problematic, it means that you're giving up a very large sense of your sense of self. This is my sense of self. It is useless, it is pointless, and you're able to let go of that and you're narrowing down the field of the sense of self. Yeah? Here you're really seeing things in a very profound way. Yeah? So this is all very uh, cha interesting. Yeah? And very, it's challenging when we think about it. When, when you do it, it's kind of natural. It's just kind of fun. Yeah? And it's just very enjoyable, this whole, this whole practice. Uh, and the, um, the will kind of comes to an end. And, uh, this is also very interesting from the a point of view of uh, uh, dependent origination. Yeah, in dependent origination, you have a vidya pachya sankara, sankara pachya vinyana. From a vidya, ignorance, delusion, come the sankaras, the will. We are willing in the world because of sankaras. But once that avidja, once that ignorance and delusion starts to fade away, we see things more clearly. And one of the things you see is that the will itself actually is painful. Then, of course, sankara, which is the will, you don't create any sankaras anymore. You stop willing, you stop trying to create the future, because that whole process of creation, making the future, is problematic. And then, because you don't have sankara, sankara pacha vinyana, sankara is the cause, condition for consciousness, you don't create a future existence through that willing activity and the craving that is part of that. So sankara is fading away and gaining insight into the nature of the will. And then the last one is vinyana, is consciousness itself. Yeah? And uh, consciousness itself is the awareness behind everything. And of course, the awareness behind everything seems to be always there. Yeah? It seems to be like a given thing that is always present. But the deeper you go, you start to see that consciousness itself actually is not really a given constant. 
consciousness itself is something that changes over time. There's the consciousness of the second jhana and there's a the consciousness of the third jhana and they are different. It's like you are chopping off parts of consciousness. Or you can see that the consciousness to do with the senses is completely gone. All you have left is the consciousness of the mind. What used to be felt as a unified consciousness, you start to see as actually being chopped up into various aspects. There is no continuity between these things. This is hard to see because this is where it gets really, really profound, right? Very difficult to see these things. But this is ultimately where all of this is heading here. So in your practice, uh, you can start to look for these things. Yeah? Don't start with the most difficult things, start with the simple things. Uh, and as you go through the process of calming down your mind, uh, uh, then you, when you come to the end, uh, ask yourself what was missing? Uh, yeah? What was the result of this missing? Was it happiness or was it suffering? Uh, and you start to get an insight into happiness and suffering. Uh, you start to get an insight into impermanence. And as you start to go very deep, the understanding of non-self also comes along as a consequence. So every stage of the path, you don't have to have a full samadhi to start to see these things. Yeah? You can start to see these things already with a lesser kind of karma. So with every step you can see a little bit, but the deeper your meditation, the more profoundly you will see what is going on. And this is why, one of the reasons why samadhi is so useful on this path, because when you enter samadhi, the impermanence of these things becomes crystal clear. Before that, it is still a bit murky. You don't know how far it goes. But samadhi, because you have no longer have any access to many of these things, it means that impermanence, is, there's no doubt anymore about what is going on. It gives you very powerful data, which makes the insight all the more powerful and obvious as a consequence. So it's enjoyable, right? You do this, uh, you enjoy the peace and the quiet, uh, and you have always thought that the idea of non-self is so scary. Uh, but now you see with your own insight, with your own mind, how delightful it is. Uh, let it all go, uh, let it be all kind of fade away, uh, and you start to, to wonder why you were so attached to all of this self-business, uh, when actually fading away is far more beautiful, far more reliable, far more conducive to happiness and joy and all of these kind of things. Uh, and you start to kind of get, really get into this idea of non-self perhaps. Uh, so this is how this process uh, can happen. Yeah? Gradually, gradually uncovering these things. Uh, I wish I had brought had the Anapanasati Sutta here because it would have been a bit more clear. But uh, nevertheless, I've talked about this elsewhere as well. So you can check it out in those other cases. Uh, and then uh, as you do this, uh, you keep on seeing the impermanence, the cessation of these things, uh, then there comes a point when you have the Patinisagga Nupas. It's the very last stage of the Anapanasati Sutta. And Patinisagga means to relinquish. It means to let go. It means the ending of craving, right? Uh, relinquishment, the final relinquishment, is when you end up all craving for these things. Uh, and that is the ending of the whole path. Uh, you come to the very end. And this is why the very humble practice, the very humble breath can take you all the way to the end of the Buddhist path. So, there you are. <laughs> Does it make any sense to anyone? I hope it makes a bit of sense to you. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it is kind of much more natural than we think it is. Sometimes you read about these things and it seems kind of all very highfalutin and maybe very um, uh, theoretical in a sense, but actually it is just what we do. It's just like our ordinary experience yeah, when we go through deep meditation in this way. Yeah. Anyway, I will um, leave it at that because um, there is more, there are more suttas, so we don't want to kind of uh, uh, lose out on some of the, on this last sutta. I'm going to have a look at one more sutta on the five aggregates. Uh, and uh, this is a very famous sutta called the Lump of Foam. Uh, and this uh, explains the, these five aggregates, these five personality factors uh, with some nice similes. I thought it would be nice to have a quick look at those similes before we finish the discussion on the aggregates. Uh, this is the very last sutta uh, in the uh, 
pack in the kind of uh, bunch you got there here. All right, so I'm really bombarding you with uh, things now. I hope you are able to kind of deal with it. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so let's see what happens. This is, uh, again, Sangyuta Nikaya, the Connected Discourses, uh, 22nd chapter, uh, Sutta number 95, uh, A Lump of Foam. So this is what, this is how it goes. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Ayodhya, on the bank of the Ganges River. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, suppose this Ganges River was carrying along a big lump of foam. And a person with good eyesight would see it and contemplate it, examining it carefully. And it would appear to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a lump of foam? In the same way, a mendicant sees and contemplates any kind of form at all, past, future or present, internal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, near or far, examining it carefully. And it appears to them as completely void, hollow and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in form. Yeah, so he compares form, yeah, body or any form that you experience in higher states of consciousness, uh, all of that, you, uh, it looks like a lump of foam. And uh, a lump of foam is kind of interesting. Yeah, when you have a lump of foam, maybe there's a, sometimes you have these large lumps of foam, maybe if it's a large river, uh, and it's just a mass of bubbles, right? And if you look at that mass of bubbles, there are bubbles kind of popping and coming into existence all the time. It's always changing, always morphing into something else, yeah? And uh, in, in kind of uh, in an insubstantial way, without any core, any bubble can happen at any, can disappear at any time, and any bubble can kind of appear at any time. There's this movement without any solid foundation to it. And our body is a bit like that. Yeah, it's always changing. Yeah. It's always kind of you know, getting thin and getting fat. And you know, as you get older, you get, you, when you're young, you get taller. And when you get older, you get shorter again. Yeah. That's kind of the, the scare. <laughs> One of the things about getting older, kind of <laughs> gradually getting, getting shorter. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, it's interesting. I could see that in my father, because my father used to be, he was almost as tall as I was. Uh, uh, and then it started to shrink, yeah, and uh, <laughs> it was very interesting to see that. You can really see when people get, especially when they get to over a certain age, uh, you start to shrink quite rapidly. Uh, anyway, kind of a little bit beside the point. But the body is always uh, changing, yeah, always morphing. There's no substance to it. Uh, and uh, it's like a lump of foam on this river, on the river Ganges. Uh, and it's kind of fascinating, yeah. There is a nice sutta where the Buddha talks about uh, um, you know, again, about this idea of a sense of self. And he says, what is interesting, now we have already looked at the body and we will see that the mind is even more changeable than the body. And he says to his disciples, says, well, if you're going to take anything as a self, take the body as a self, yeah? Because at least the body is kind of there for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. Whereas the mind, just one moment like this, another moment like that, changing all the time. And yet we do the exact opposite. Yeah, the body, we can sort of agree. The body is not self. Yeah, it's going to end up in the crematorium. As I said yesterday, a little pile of ashes is all going to be gone. We kind of get that. But the mind, that is the real me. But actually, it should really be the other way around. The mind is that which is always changing. The body, at least, it lasts for a while, or so it seems. Anyway, so the body is like this lump of foam. Yeah, there's nothing really there. It's hollow, it's empty. There's nothing really to hold on to at the end of the day here, or at the end of the life, or whatever it is. Okay, suppose it was the time of autumn when the rain was falling heavily and a bubble on the water forms and pops right away. And a person with good eyesight would see it and contemplate it, examining it carefully. And it would appear to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance 
could there be in a water bubble? Huh? In the same way, a mendicant sees and contemplates any kind of feeling at all, past, future, or present, internal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, near or far, examining it carefully. Huh? And it peers to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. Huh? For what substance uh, could there be in feeling? Yeah? yeah, like a water bubble, right? This is not a lump of foam. This kind of lasts a long time compared to a water bubble. It's nothing, yeah? And it's just incredibly unreliable, coming into existence, disappearing, gone again. Uh, yeah, there's nothing really there. Huh? And this is what I was saying before when I were talking about the idea of feelings. Uh, yeah, the feelings that you are feeling right now will really depend. It will shift all the time. Yeah? Shifting from feeling a little bit of pain in the body, uh, then maybe seeing something which is kind of nice, yeah, this room, hearing something that maybe you enjoy, uh, and then back and forth and changing and completely unreliable, always popping, always a new feeling arising. Yeah? No substance to it. There's no core to it. Uh, and yet somehow we rely on these feelings. This is one of the most important things in our life, is the idea that we want to have more good feelings and less bad feelings. This is the, one of the main drivers in our existence, as I mentioned just before. But of course, it's impossible to hold on to. And then maybe we attain a jhana state, and then we think, yeah, now I know what happiness is. I'm going to hold on to this. And this bubble lasts for a long time. Yeah? Finally, you find a bubble. Maybe this bubble is permanent. Maybe it's made of titanium or something like that. It's not a water bubble. It's a real bubble. This is the real deal. Of course, that too. Even titanium is impermanent. And one day it bursts, and you cannot hold on to it. But it's extremely attractive yeah, to hold on to those kind of bubbles uh, that form out of samadhi uh, because these are the most happiest things you ever experienced in existence. Uh, and they have many of the aspects that you would think a self has. Yeah? It feels solid. It feels more real than anything you ever experienced in your life. The greatest bliss of your entire existence. The sense of self is largely gone because there's only consciousness left. And it's incredibly tempting to take that as a self. Because everything you've ever heard, well, if, this, if anything is a self, surely this is. But what we do then, we overstep the evidence. Instead of seeing that these states, they arise and then they pass away, uh, we come out of the state of samadhi. Instead of seeing that as it actually is, we postulate that this is the reality behind appearances. And when we die, we kind of get rejoined with this kind of uh, uh, samadhi behind the scenes that is always there, the Mahabrahma of the universe or the creator God or whatever it is. Uh, and we go beyond the evidence and we postulate something more. Uh, but the Buddha said, wait a minute, actually, no. You enter samadhi, you come out. That's all we know. There's no grounds for postulating any permanent state beyond that experience. But this is what human beings do. Uh, and this is one of the main reasons why we have religions that are based on these ideas of permanent selves and Mahabrahmas and all of these kind of things. Because we postulate things, we go beyond the evidence and we assume things that there's no basis for assuming anything about. So uh, this is the uh, contemplation of feeling. Let's go on to perception. Suppose that in the last month of the summer, at noon, a shimmering mirage appears, and a person with good eyesight would see it and contemplate it, examining it carefully. And it would appear to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a mirage? In the same way, a mendicant sees and contemplates any kind of perception at all, past, future, or present, internal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, near or far, examining it carefully, and it appears to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in perception? 
the mirage, yeah, this is kind of very fascinating. This is getting more and more insubstantial as we go along, less and less anything at all. Uh, yeah, you know, like a mirage is like when you travel on the road and you s it looks like there's a puddle in front of you on a hot day and it just turns out to be a trick of the air. Yeah, it looks like a puddle. When you get closer, it just disappears. There was nothing there. Same thing when you walk in the desert, you can see lakes. This is kind of the thing which is kind of despairing for the desert walkers who are thirsty and desperate and they see a lake in the distance and it turns out to be a mirage, yeah? The happiness was a mirage. Everything was just a mirage. And our perceptions of the world are like mirages. Why is that? And the reason is because it is so easy to change. Yeah, there is nothing, it, they're not actually real in any real way. Like we were talking about before, the idea of changing our perception of the people around us. Yeah, you see some negative quality in somebody and then you get upset with them. And then you just swap over and you see the goodness and suddenly they are your, you have compassion for them. In the flip, in a, in, a, in a moment, yeah, this change happens. So which one is real? Are they your friend or are they your enemy? Are there someone worthy of compassion or someone worthy of anger and ill will? What is going on there? The perception is switched just like that. There's no reality to it. It's a mirage. It is how we use our mind that decides whether we see one thing or we see the other. So it's kind of empty. Yeah? Everything is, there's, there's nothing really there. And this is uh, true, especially of all of these conceptual perceptions that we have. Uh, but even the perceptions that we have of you know, everyday life, uh, things appear slightly different one day from another one. Uh, one day you are in a good mood and the world is bright and beautiful. The next day you are grumpy and the world is kind of dark and gray and miserable. Yeah? Your perce entire perception of everything changes just because of your mood one day. Yeah? Yeah? So some days it's best to keep your mouth shut because you know what's going to come out. It's not going to be nice because you kind of got out on the wrong side of bed or whatever in the morning. Yeah. And, but it's hollow. There's nothing really there. It's just this kind of uh, you know, thing which does, doesn't really exist or it exists, but it doesn't really exist in, a, in any way that is substantial. It's a mirage. It's a beautiful way of thinking about things because it allows us so much flexibility in changing things. Yeah? If things are a mirage, it means that at any time we can change things. Any time we can see something differently. So there is an upside to this. Yeah? We're not trapped in the way we see the world. It is actually, if we really try and we do things in the right way, we can change things over just like that. The majority of people, we think we are trapped. And this is why you see people in life committing suicide. Yeah, you are so depressed, you are so sad, you have lost everything in life. Things seem so permanent, and because they seem permanent, that's why people usually commit suicide. But they are not. Yeah, things are always changing. And this is why this story of Ajahn Brahm always telling people, who, you know, who have a really hard, going through a very hard time. Uh, uh, it's the, um, uh, the story of this too will pass. Yeah, this too will pass. And it's actually a very profound story. And sometimes it can pass like that. It's not going to linger. It's not going to, you know, these things are so uncertain, so unreliable. And we don't see that usually. That's part of the problem. Huh? So perception is like a mirage. So come, let's come to the fourth kanda, sankara. Suppose there was a person in need of heartwood. Heartwood is like the core of the tree, right? Wandering in search of heartwood, they would take a sharp axe and enter a forest. There they would see a big banana tree, straight and young and grown free of defects. They would cut it down at the base, cut off the top and unroll unroll the coiled sheaths. But they couldn't even find any sapwood, much less heartwood. And a person with good eyesight would see it and contemplate it and examine it carefully. And it would appear to them as completely void and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a banana tree? In the same way, a mendicant sees and contemplates any kind of choice or volition at all, past, future or present, uh, internal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, near or far, examining it carefully. Uh, 
and it appears to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in will or in choice? So the choice is the will, is like a banana tree. Banana trees are famous, also called plantain trees. They are famous for not having any substance. It's like an onion, you just peel and peel and peel, and there's no core, you just end up with nothing within. And uh, the idea of our choices are like that. Uh, yeah, in meditation, we are starting to peel off the layers uh, of choice. Uh, we are abandoning the will gradually, stage by stage. Uh, we are abandoning the coarser will, which uh, makes for the movement of the mind all the time, thinking this and that, uh, calming that down. Uh, and then we are gradually calming down the mind more and more. It becomes more and more peaceful, less and less interested in the various things of the world. Until eventually there is just a very subtle will that directs you to the meditation object. And then this appears to be the core of the will. And then you abandon that, you go beyond that, and you enter a deep state of samadhi. The will is completely gone. It was hollow. There was no substance to it. You're better off without it. It is all empty and devoid of substance. Peeling it away, there's nothing there, and you realize that your identifying with the will was a big mistake, and the only thing it does is create suffering for yourself. Okay, the very last kanda. Suppose a magician or the apprentice was to perform a magic trick at the crossroads. And a person with good eyesight would see it and contemplate it, examining it carefully. And it would appear to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be to a magic trick? In the same way, a mendicant sees and contemplates any kind of consciousness at all past, future, or present, internal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, near or far, examining it carefully. And it appears to them as completely void, hollow, and, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in consciousness? <laughs> what substance could there be in consciousness? Right. So... Um, Consciousness is like a magic trick, right? It's kind of a really fascinating uh, idea. And of course, a magic trick, of course, again, it's a bit like a mirage, right? You're seeing something which isn't really there. Yeah, there's no, nothing really to it at all. But it's kind of interesting, this idea that it is like magic, yeah? It is almost like is as if consciousness is really hard to explain. It's kind of one of these weird things in existence, the fact that we are aware of things at all. Why are we aware of anything here? Yeah, it's like this kind of thing that emerges and out of something we can't really comprehend. And it's kind of strange. It's like a magic trick. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't really, I must admit I'm not entirely sure exactly how to understand that. But the main point is that magic is insubstantial. We're seeing something which isn't actually there. Yeah? There is no real inherent essence even to consciousness. <laughs> Consciousness can cease completely, come to a complete end. And we will see this afterwards when we go back to the Potapada Sutta again afterwards. We will actually see that we are talking about the cessation and ending of consciousness and what that means. And then consciousness comes to an end and then it restarts again. Yeah, it's back again. And then you realize, actually, there was nothing there. And I'm very happy when consciousness is gone. How can you be happy when consciousness is gone? Well. That's precisely why you're happy, because it's gone. It's actually, it's like feeling, yeah, feeling is all gone. How can you be happy when feeling is gone? Well, that is the happiness, the fact that feeling is gone. This is kind of what these things are. This is why they are so profound and difficult to understand. So ultimately, consciousness itself is a magic trick. And what that means, all consciousness is like magic. Everything, the whole gamut, yeah, there is no corner in samsaric existence. There is no place where you can be reborn, where consciousness is kind of the final consciousness where you will hang out forever after. The whole of samsaric existence, regardless of where you get reborn, regardless of the refinement you achieve in samadhi, whatever it is, everything, all consciousness 
is like a magic trick. Yeah. There's nothing there, nothing interesting. You're being fooled all the time. This is kind of the idea of, of magic. We are being fooled by consciousness. It is the most profound aspect of our reality. It is the last thing that remains when everything else seems changeable. But that too turns out to be empty. Seeing this, a learned noble disciple uh, grows disillusioned with form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. Uh, being disillusioned, desire is given up or fades away. Uh, when desire fades away, they are freed. Uh, when they are freed, they know they are freed. Uh, they understand. Uh, rebirth is ended. Uh, the spiritual journey has been completed. Uh, what had to be done has been done. Uh, there is no return to any state of existence. <coughs> so, uh, there you are. So there are those uh, wonderful and marvelous similes uh, about the five khandhas. Uh, and uh, that is uh, all we're going to talk about the five khandhas uh, on this retreat. Uh, and tomorrow morning we're going to wrap up the last part of the Potapada Sutta. And uh, so that's kind of what uh, is, uh, stands out. But before that, uh, we still have a few hours left of this retreat. Uh, so please keep on enjoying yourself. Uh, and we'll see you back again at 7 o'clock this evening. Yeah.